So, you probably remember the caper of the missing screws. That has been fixed, so the pin and lantern gear now does not fall to pieces. We're going to now check the fit of this shaft in here, because this guy is the final horizontal shaft before, before it goes up to the governor, right? And we've got a pretty not good fit between this bevel gear, right? You see how there's free play? So I'm going to have to make a bush that either goes there. Better still, it would go in here to, to make up that space because, let me show you. This thing's kind of just a mess right now until it goes back together. But this gear screws on to this plate. Right, I've got to make another screw because it's missing one. But this gear can be stood off without moving this shaft, which I think would be the better option. So we might make a bush for that today. But first, let me just, you know, we'll have to kind of dry fit the thing and then take it apart again to see, see how thick the bushing needs to be, etc. So for now, we're going to start putting the thing back together. Yeah, so, yeah, that's got, this has an unacceptable amount of free play. You see, showing this, that is not, absolutely not going to cut it. And this here should be a little bit elevated too. So I've got to make a standoff for this, and I've got to make a bushing for that. So I'll get my calipers and we'll do that. And we also, before we do that, this is the brake plate, all right? That doesn't have any <laughs> bearing, so to speak, on the shaft alignment. Let's see. Got to find out what's from where. But we're not going to put everything in tight. All right, so we're going to make a standoff for 70 thou and for 110. I just took the measurements. So we'll go and we'll chuck up some of this bearing bronze in the lathe. And then we got to get our pin diameters and turn the suit. So now I'm going to have to take that thing apart again. This lathe, I need to make a video on itself because this is a kind of a famous lathe. Um, Arthur Hughes, the famous local area steam man, friend of George Eli Whitney and friend of my friend Tom Bonomi for many years. This was his lathe. This was, uh, this was Arthur Hughes's lathe when he was the chief engineer of the Ocean Liner City of Hamburg for the Baltimore Mail Line. And this lathe went everywhere that liner went in its engine room with art. And he took very good care of it. And I'm only the third owner, kind of the second, because... The second owner was Tommy's brother, Jimmy Bonomi, who never used it. He just took care of it and kept it clean. So this is a, uh, a pretty special little machine. Got wick oilers for the spindle here. That's how you turn them on. You drop the wicks in, gonna add some spindle oil, but you see how those work. He made these out of, uh, out of gun cartridges. Kind of a resourceful fellow. But what I'll do with this, I'll make a proper video on it, all about Art Hughes and his engines and this lathe. We'll get Tom here to come and talk about it. Get all this crap off this thing first. There we go. That's bearing bronze right there, which is what you want for a job like this. 
three jaw trucks are of course not the most accurate so I want to get there we go no visible run out that'll be good enough for this job going to be very grabby. You want to get the right speed and feet. I kind of do all my speeds and feeds intuitively. I don't have them memorized like a good machinist ought to, which is entirely my fault, but I know what feels right. You hear how it's not making any noise and it's making these long chips. This is a high-speed steel bit in here. No, no carbide or anything like this. doing roughing cuts right now but if it's making noise if it's chattering if it makes a bad cut then you know you got it wrong so let's see that's a pretty good piece to start with we'll finish it later now I got to get a center drill so we're gonna grab our trusty number two Morse tape for Jacob's Chuck put this in here got to find a center drill One thing Arthur Hughes loved was organization. This He built this board, and I'm still kind of organizing it. So we need a tailstock wrench. We need the truck key for the Jacobs. But it's just, it's so nice that he had it all uh, exactly where it ought to have been set up for himself. There's another thing Art liked. Rows and rows of holes in everything. It's like you're building an airship or something with him every time you look. He's got this locomotive that I'm trying to find before... Certain other parties find it. And the, even the, the little tang on the end of the expansion link in the Wall Street's valve gear just got lots and lots of holes. And they're all different sizes, so they're not holes for adjusting the valve gear. They're just there. He did the same thing with the 5A that Tommy owns. We're going to part off. You want the tool advance to be slow and steady. So we're going to throw in the cross-slide power feed for this at a pretty slow rate of speed. And... Let's see, we've got that set up. That's going in the right direction. And there it goes. And we should get a nice clean bushing off of this. That feels much better. All right, now let's see if I remember where what goes. That bush goes there. Is that maintenance gearing that John Sherwood did so nicely. Big thank you to him with that. Yeah, you mesh with that. So... Just like that. That bush goes there. That bush goes in there. I'm not going to do anything with this yet. We're going to lift this guy back in place.
you see these watchmakers do this with pocket watch. It's like I almost don't know what's harder, you know, doing it with a tower clock movement where everything weighs a heck of a lot, or a little wristwatch where you got to line up these little shafts under a microscope. So these here, figured I should show you these. These are the special nuts that go on the ends. I have to create a pin spanner for those. So until I do that, we won't be able to get those really snug. I actually had to get them out with two pin drives with a crossbar. It was not an easy job. But, you know, that's that. Now these bolts here, sorry, those go in the legs. The governor. I'm going to renew the brake material in there. It was cork, I believe. But I'll show you how these go in. This is number one here. Always follow your, your witness marks. Two. Okay, and now the final drive. I'll show you now. The way it actually drives the lens, right? There's our final drive shafts. So that guy goes in there. It's a bit of a mess to get together. There we go. Now this plate will come like that. Of course, the screws and everything have to go in, but let me show you. The lens drive gear would go there. Here's your top oil and adjustment access for the top bearing of the governor. All right. And the way this works basically is this here, the maintenance gearing, right? You see in here, you put a crank on this end, a square that John repaired, right? It winds up the drum. So, you see how the maintenance gearing works, where even as the mechanism is turning, I can still wind the gears. You see how it's, I've got the governor going and the whole mechanism is turning, but I can still wind it. They call it maintenance gearing. They invented this a long time ago for clocks so that you wouldn't interrupt the, the, clock, uh, the clock's time base by winding it. Because it used to be before the invention of maintenance gearing, the clock would stop whenever you wound it up and it would start again whenever you let the key go or the crank go. So that's what that's for. But it winds the drum up, right? Which in this case is going to pull the cable up this way on this side. You see that? The governor balls, they fly up, the weights fly up and they rub on that friction pad up there. And if those, uh, if the brake material was in, which I have to renew, which I'll do shortly, uh, it wouldn't scrape metal to metal that way, but that governor, you see, keeps the speed regulated. So there's forward. Right, and then you can wind it. See the drum's inner edge goes up now when I wind it. But as it runs, that edge goes down. And there'll be a, a cable wrapped around that. So I have to get a cable on it. This clock was made to drive a lens of about the third order size or fourth order size. It's not really powerful enough to turn a first order. Got to make a gear that goes up there. And we got to find a lens for it because right now this clock does not belong to a lens. You see, it's kind of an orphan. The guy who owns it got it from my friend Tim at Chance Brothers, just as a as a talking, uh, a conversation piece, I think. But he wanted me to get it working, so that's what that is. I'm sorry I can't show it to you with a lens attached, but I'm not a rich man, and we do not live in a world of ideal circumstances, usually. 
There's a few things I've got to do to it left. Like I say, the brake material and the governor ball has got to get a, a cable for it, a weight, and a sheave for the weight, etc. But that's the rebuild. Now at least the thing can work, and you can see the gear train rotate and how the governor operates. And there's all different sorts of these. Uh, they'll be, they'll, the, my favorite sort is where instead of a friction governor, there's an air brake governor where like Bernard Barbier Turenne built those where the governor weights, when they came up, they drive a little rack and pinion or some mechanism where there was a big kind of rotor, like helicopter blades with a collective, and they would vary the blade pitch as the, as the weights went out. And the further the weights went out, the further the blades would sort of turn into the airstream to make uh, air drag, and that would regulate the speed. So there was no rubbing together of any parts or anything. And those are my favorite type of lighthouse governor. So that's uh, that's most of that rebuild for you. I might take a final video when it's up and running, like totally, and all the parts are there.